So today we're going to be talking about how to get real estate taxes right as an investor. So why is this important? Um, pretty obvious. This is the biggest expense in your pro forma as an investor when you're underwriting. Um, different markets have very different rules about real estate taxes, how they assess them, how they collect them, uh, what you need to do during an appeal. Uh, and there's also a big focus on real estate taxes in certain states. Um, we've had a lot of folks that we've talked to who own in places like Florida, Texas. We own out in Colorado. There's some of those states have had, um, they've given people some surprises lately um, with what's going on in real estate taxes there. So it's this is something that we really need to understand and be prepared for so we can be as accurate as possible in our underwriting as investors. So what I hope that everybody can uh, sign off and come away with today is a, a good understanding of how counties will assess a tax value to a property. Um, want to make sure everybody understands how to project what your real estate tax expense will be on a property that you buy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's called non-disclosure states, which those can be a little bit tricky. And then we'll talk uh, a little bit as well about how to uh, structure your offer um, or uh, on a property, or maybe to say it differently, how to avoid pitfalls in the way that you structure offers. Some people give uh, what I think is some not good advice on how to structure your offers to avoid uh, an increase in real estate taxes uh, that we should be aware of so that we can recognize uh, when we're being presented with a bad idea and know to reject it. So first of all, let's talk assessed value or tax value. So what is this? What's market value of a property versus assessed value? Uh, the short answer is these have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Uh, they can influence each other, but market value is, as we all probably know, it's what it sounds like. So it's, did you what did you pay for this property? What is this property actually worth in an arm's length transaction between two buyers? This is something that in some states, the county knows. Um, sometimes they will, uh, they can see on uh, most states, they can see when you buy a property, a deed gets recorded. They can either see the sales price on that deed, or they can see what the excise tax was collected um, or transfer tax is sometimes called. And knowing the tax rate for that particular tax, they can sort of back into by doing the math, they can back into how much did you pay for this property? And they will, they will know what the actual market value is. Um, so some non-disclosure states, which we'll talk about later, do not see that. And that's a, that's a little bit um, of a different exercise um, that, like I said, we'll discuss later. On the other hand, the tax value or the assessed value of a property, this is the value that is that is actually taxed on. And there's a couple of different ways that property can get valued for tax purposes. First of all, there's the comp approach. So sales comps. This is most common in residential real estate. You know, what did the property sell for? Okay, that's going to be, you know, what are the properties around it selling for? Okay, that's what this property is worth. Um, the other most common approach is the income approach. And this is similar to how we underwrite as investors. So you'll get, as a buyer, you might get a questionnaire in the mail from the county. It says, hey, fill out, you know, Mr. Owner, fill out your income, fill out your expenses, anything else that we need to know about the property. And we will look at your NOI and we will make a determination as to what we think this is worth using the income approach. This is similar to how an appraisal will be done for commercial property. But once they come up with this tax value, that is the value upon which your tax bill will be calculated. So that's how the assessed value works. As far as how to project what your actual tax expense is going to be, uh, there's a couple of things that we need to do as we're going through the underwriting process. First of all, we need to do a lot of research on that particular state and especially that particular county. We need to know a couple of things. We need to know what's their revaluation calendar. So what I mean by that is how frequently do they revalue properties? Some states do it every four years. Some do it every two. Some do it every year. And some do even some properties, but not all properties every year. And they just sort of cycle through. Uh, we need to understand if we buy this property in, let's just say 2024, 
when do we need to be prepared for our tax bill to go up? So generally, there will be a minimum requirement set by the state. So they have to do a, a revaluation at least, you know, say every four years, and they have the ability to do it uh, more frequent than that if they want. But be sure to, when you call the county, you talk to the assessor's office, be sure to find out that information and also be sure to find out if they reassess a property at sale. Sometimes uh, there are counties that no matter when the no matter when the next reval is, when you buy a property, they get flagged that there's been a deed recorded and they will reassess the property at sale. It's not uncommon for a county to do that. So that's another question that we need to ask. We also need to know about the valuation methodology that they use. In self-storage, nine times out of 10, if not even more common, it's going to be the income approach. However, the cost approach, so we discussed the income approach, which is how we look at properties as an investor, how an appraiser looks at properties, but the, the cost approach actually does still matter. And the reason for that is because that it, there, there is a deed that gets recorded, and unless we're in a non-disclosure state, the county can see how much we paid for this property. So play out a scenario where you purchase a property and you find out that it is a county or you find this out before you purchase the property, you find out that this county does reassess at sale. So if they if they are going through their revaluation process, if it sold re very recently, you can pretty much bank that they're going to assess the property at whatever you paid for it. Because that's a very easy way. They don't even have to do an income approach. They can see, oh, well, this, you know, six months ago, this property sold for $3 million. So it's probably still worth $3 million today. On the other hand, if you have a county that doesn't reassess at sale, they still can see, again, unless it's a non-disclosure state, they can still see what you paid for it. So let's say you are you buy a property in 2024 and in 2025 is the next uh, reval calendar. Even if they go through the exercise of doing an income approach valuation, they still have in the back of their mind, I see this person paid $3 million for it you know, last year. So odds are your valuation is going to be pretty close to, if, if not exceeding that $3 million, because it's a number that they already have in their mind. So that's uh, they're, they're going to work through their income approach and probably come up with something pretty similar to that. So what is the point of all that, um, everything that we just discussed? The point is we need to be prepared for our property to be valued at 100% of the purchase price. So whatever the price we paid, we need to be okay in our investment returns if the property does get valued at that, uh, at that number. So this will involve calling the assessor's office, uh, making sure that we understand the valuation methodology, the calendar, all of that. And then as far as how to actually project the taxes, it's just simple math. So we, we should have, as an investor, we should have had the tax bills um, that we've gotten either from the seller or downloaded online. We should be able to find the tax rates and we just compute what's the tax rate times you know what I'm, what I'm going to pay for this property. And we should have a pretty good idea of what our tax expense will be at the next reassessment. It's also good to find out how often rates are adjusted. In a lot of counties, they will slightly reduce the tax rates when uh, when properties get revalued uh, countywide um, so that the the resulting tax bills are not just egregiously increased um, and they don't provide a shock to the county's economy. Uh, so find out how often rates are adjusted and sort of how that process works. So if you go through those steps, you'll be able to project pretty easily what your tax bill is going to be. Um, you should be prepared to manage the asset that you're buying uh, without too many surprises as far as taxes go. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, I mentioned, non-disclosure states. So the non-disclosure states are, again, these are states where they don't see on the deed that gets recorded, they don't see how much you paid for this property. They don't see the transfer tax. They don't know anything. So it, it, this might sound like a, a good idea at first. Oh, well, you know, this property is currently valued for a million dollars at tax purposes. I can pay $3 million and I'm getting a great deal. 
well, they have no idea I'm paying $3 million, so I probably won't really get that big of an increase. Well, that's not necessarily true. We have seen, especially in some of the states that I mentioned, we've seen properties get valued at higher than what the purchase price was. And what that requires then is you have to appeal and make sure that be because if it's valued higher than what you paid in an arm's length transaction, then it should be considered value overvalued because uh, it's over the market value. So what we what our uh, uh, what what our answer to that is is we need to be able to show that county, hey, this is a crazy valuation. You know, I paid three million for this six months ago, and you're saying it's worth five million. We can show them the purchase contract or the settlement statement. And we can say, hey, county, I actually paid $3 million for this. That's what it should be. Uh, so we have a fallback option. But if we had, say, $1.5 million in that scenario that I that I described, currently valued a $1 million, we're paying $3 million. If in our underwriting, we assumed that the value would only go up to maybe $1.5, so just an increase over the $1 million, then we could be in trouble because we're looking at a tax bill that's probably going to be close to double what we had in our underwriting. Because the best we can do is tell them, hey, this isn't worth five, it's worth three because three is what I paid. So the point of that is we need to be prepared still that that a property will be assessed at the, the purchase price uh, because we don't want to get surprised as investors. Now, there's some additional work that you can do on non-disclosure states uh, to to help to help yourself be a little bit more informed, one exercise you can go through is you can do you can pull sort of a sample of different properties in that submarket that have sold in the last you know say three years, see what happened to their tax value as they uh, um, a, as they were sold and then revalued, and you can sometimes come up with a pretty good idea of how that county is going to handle it, but at the end of the day you just don't know because they don't know what you paid. Uh, so it, it's very easy to get surprised in non-disclosure states. So make sure you're underwriting uh, conservatively when you're looking at real estate taxes and you can avoid falling into, uh, you, you can avoid uh, getting unpleasantly surprised as an investor. Last thing, when we talk about how to structure our offers, one piece of advice that we have been given by uh, some folks is, well, why don't you do an entity sale? So this would be the, the situation where we've run into is we're looking at a property, they want what we believe is way too much money for it. And someone might say, well, if you just buy our LLC, so in other words, you're not buying the property, there's not gonna be a deed recorded, you're just buying our LLC interest, then the county doesn't even know that it's been sold and you know, you'll be okay. You won't even get revalued. Well, there's a lot of problems with an entity sale. First of all, there's a lot of liability that you are potentially exposed to. You have no idea as an investor what that seller has done with that LLC. For all we know, they could have done something crazy you know, five years ago that all of a sudden you're going to be on the hook for because they're going to get sued you know, potentially and you're going to have to defend something that you didn't even do. So there's a lot of potential liability that makes this not a good idea. Another problem with it is you have high legal fees usually. An asset purchase is much cheaper from a legal standpoint to go through the due diligence process and the contract process. It's much cheaper to do an asset sale than it is to do an entity sale because your attorney is going to tell you, hey, you're buying an LLC here that you have no idea what they've done for the last five years. We need to do a lot of searching, a lot of due diligence on this. So it can be expensive. You expose yourself to liability. Uh, so this, this is an entity sale is not a good idea. Always do an asset sale. If you get an advice to do an entity sale, uh, that's not the direction that you want to go. Uh, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to go over today. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope everybody's got a good idea of how you can underwrite conservatively, underwrite correctly, not get surprised with real estate taxes. I don't see anything coming in on the Q&A here. So we will go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thanks everybody for attending.
Keep an eye on the Storage of Western Nation website for the next topic that will get posted. Hope you guys are enjoying these. Reach out to us on Facebook if there's anything that you guys want to hear about that we're not talking about. Uh, and we'd love to make sure that we are uh, giving you guys content that's going to help you on your investing journey. So until next time, I'm John Allen. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.